pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that we could all get together to get into your word. We pray, Lord, that you'll open the eyes of our understanding, draw us closer to you, Lord. We know your word never returns to you void. Let it accomplish whatever it is that you'd have it done in our lives. We pray for uh, Kathy as well, for her physical ailments. We know how merciful you've been with her, Lord. Continue to uh, give her healing virtue and help her through any of these afflictions she's going through, Lord. And everybody else on the call as well. We all have something going on. We pray for a touch from your hand. And we pray for our nation, Lord. You know what a turmoil it's in right now. We're under evil rulership. We pray that you'll keep your hand upon everyone serving you. We pray that you'll draw those who are willing to come into your family and, and to touch them and, and uh, open their eyes to the truth, Lord. It can only be done by you. No one comes to uh, the Father unless, uh, no one comes to Jesus except through the Father. And we also uh, pray for Carlos that you'll help him through the message tonight, Lord. Give him a, a anointing and put in his mouth what you'd have him to say. We love you. We give you all the glory and praise for it in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eddie. Well, we're going to start in the First John, uh, First John Epistle, chapter one tonight. Uh, I spoke with uh, someone who requested, you know, that we go ahead and start on that, and I'm all for it. Um, <clears throat> before we actually start, the, the, can you see the screen? Is it? Am I sharing yeah. it okay? Yeah, okay, I can great. Plan. And that's a great book too. Uh, it is. It really, truly is. And there's a lot of good information in there. But you have to dig, like everything, you know. You, you have to you have to spend some time in it and let the Lord really speak to your heart. Which reminds me, I, I can remember one time, you know, sharing uh, sharing a study, and I had this one individual tell me, "Well, you know, we all know this stuff already. Uh, you know, why why should we spend time studying the stuff that we already know?" Now, I don't really believe that he was speaking for everybody, but. That really is an ignorant statement, uh, you know, because the scripture says that if any man thinks he, he knows anything, he knows nothing as he ought. And um, the reality is that, that if it was as simple as just reading it through one or two or three or four times, by now we should all be absolute masters. And there should be nothing new that we're getting out of this. But I will tell you this, that the more I read, the more I see, the more I learn, the more uh, grounded I get, the more understand, I mean, truly understand. And uh, so anyone who takes that kind of an attitude or uh, says something like that, it, I really have to question where, where they are with the Lord. I really do. And, and that was the case with this particular individual. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and start in First John. I don't know, is Cindy on yet? Uh, does she want to or can or whoever wants to read or can read? Will you help me here? Okay, no one's on? Uh, Ken's back on. Well, he's on mute right now. Uh, he might be helping Cindy get on. She's having yeah, trouble. Yeah, I think she's having some physical problems too. Okay, well, let me go ahead and start here and if uh if they can't then ed maybe you can do it and hopefully your your phone won't die out and if it does then i'll take it back over yeah or maybe they can uh, get in there uh, if it does right. okay great well here it is first john uh, actually i should put one on there okay it says let me take a moment to address certain contrived controversies in regard to john's writings I say contrived because it seems that the arguments are presented to have people question the authenticity of these writings. But what is crucial is that the doctrine that is discussed in John's writings is in harmony with the rest of the New Testament writings, which points to divine inspiration. The discussions revolve around 
when the different epistles and the Gospel of John were written, as though that was indispensable in determining the authenticity of the writings, a clear attempt at having people take their eye off the ball. So this is one of one of the uh, theological arguments that I have, you know, been aware of over the years uh, about the epistles of John and the Gospel of John, that there's, you know, actually questioning when it was written and what the order was. And, and, and people actually make a big deal over this. And so it just, it really is. It's a, it's, it's a complete distraction. And, and yet, nevertheless, you have a lot of theologians out there, you know, disputing all of this stuff. Okay, and then secondly, some people question whether the Apostle John was the author of some or none of the writings. Because there's some people that are putting forth that John didn't write any of these, that it was just some other John, not the Apostle John, or some altogether other figure who wasn't even named John. I don't know where they get all of that, but I mean, I understand that there were other Johns talked about in the Bible, but I think it's pretty clear that this is written by the Apostle John. And here's what I want to bring out about that. So, well, it is established by the historical writings of the early church fathers that John outlived the other apostles. This is pretty well undisputed. Everyone acknowledges that John outlived, you know, the other apostles. Uh, and some of the legend around it, which I don't know that it's a fact, but, you know, that the whole reason that he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos was because they tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't boil. So they, you know, dispatched him to the island to uh, isolate him to keep him from being effective and reaching people. Uh, I don't know the truth of all of that, but that is what is, is out there. But the point is that he outlived all the other apostles, and that's pretty well goes uncontested. So if the writings of the other apostles are not in question, right, people don't question the authenticity of Peter. They don't question the authenticity of Paul's epistles. I mean, some people, but for the most part, no. Uh, you know, I would think that the apostle John, who outlived them all, would have been more easily recognized by the same early church fathers as the true author of these writings, which is the case. The early church fathers refer to the Apostle John and his writings and give it validity. And I think it's important, for, for reasons that we'll get into as we start studying here, that, that we recognize that this is the Apostle John, uh, particularly in the opening verse of this epistle. It, it's so important. So again, it's a diversion to have us question these very important writings. So all of these different arguments that are put forth, you know, it, it really is nothing but the enemy uh, hoping to call into question uh, the authenticity of the canon, uh, you know. And, and look, this is not surprising. Uh, so many of the people I know that attended Bible school and seminary come out of those institutions questioning their faith because they have professors that teach them to doubt the uh, inerrancy of the Bible as though, well, you know, we can't, we can't have complete confidence that this book was written by this individual. We can't have complete confidence that God had his hand in it and that some men didn't pervert it or, you know, corrupt it somehow. This is, it is just, and it's so ridiculous, brethren, because the more I study the scriptures, the more I'm convinced how much God is just, you know, he, he went to great lengths to preserve it for us. And it harmonizes so perfectly that uh, I appreciate God for that. I truly do. So it's just a diversion. Okay, um, is, any, is anybody available to uh, help me read here? Cindy, Ken, or Eddie, if you can. I can, I can do it for you. I guess Ken ain't back yet. I guess not. They must be having trouble getting, getting on. So if you can pick it up at these epistles. Okay. 
These epistles are devoted to identifying the difference between the light and darkness, 1 John 2, 8 and 9, and between the spirit of error and the spirit of truth, 1 John 4, 6. And John repeatedly warns us to not be deceived, 1 John 1, 8, 1 John 3, 7, 2 John 1, 7. If this exhortation was necessary in John's day, how much more in our day as we have been warned that things that things will be worse? Second Timothy three verses one through thirteen. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So look, as we're going to be studying here in, in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, <clears throat> he, is devote, he is trying to help us to be able to discern between the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. And uh, again, if it was something that he had to spend time to instruct the churches on it in his day it's, it has to be much worse and much more necessary in our day because it is worse you know as second timothy 3 1 through 13 in the last days perilous times shall come and, and we've talked about this before to me the, the most perilous thing for a believer is not that they might lose their life or that they could be martyred they could be beheaded or whatever that's not the most perilous thing. That, that, in fact, is ushering us into eternity and everything that we're longing for. No, the most perilous thing for a believer is that they would be deceived. And, you know, Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name. And if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect regarding the end times. That's what Jesus said. And so Second Timothy is just verifying all of that. And, you know, when people read Second Timothy 3, 1 through uh, 13, they, they, they look at these characteristics and, and you know, they, they see certain things. And they say, well, you know, this, this, this uh, false teacher, I don't, I don't see that he's disobedient to parents. I don't think that he's unthankful. Uh, you know, I don't think that he's without natural affection. And, and the point is this. I don't want you to think that, Every false teacher, every deceiver is going to have all of these. No, but all of these characteristics, are they're, they're, they're not according to godliness. That's the thing you should understand. They may not uh, demonstrate all of these characteristics, but that doesn't mean that they're not deceivers. What I would like, what I have highlighted here is that they have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof from such turn away. The power of godliness, the power of, uh, of, of the life in Christ is the fact that we are able to crucify the flesh and live a life of holiness. Uh, it, it's, it's according to the Spirit, uh, the Holy Ghost working in us. And uh, I think that that's an important thing. Yes, most of these guys are covetous. Uh, they, some of them are able to hide it pretty well, but at the heart of it is uh, they want. They either covet filthy lucre or they covet position. They want to be recognized. They want to be uh, a rabbi, which Jesus said that we are not to be, and, and that means a teacher. They want to be recognized as a somebody, and so their covetousness may not just be around filthy lucre. It can be other things such as that. But I'm not going to cover any more of those particular characteristics. It's just the point that in the last days, 
we're going to be dealing with deception to an even greater extent than in the days that John was writing these epistles. All right, would anybody else like to share anything before we go on? Okay, yeah. Eddie, if you – okay, good. yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, the, what I would say is I know it's getting worse because the sheer number of deceivers out there, not only the deceivers, but the people that are being deceived. You've gone into a bunch of them on this call, all, you know, already, the Hebrew Roots people, the once saved, always saved. I mean, there's just one false teaching after the other, and what scares me is you know we the the uh, way you can tell if it's a false teaching obviously is it doesn't line up with the word of God but the number of people that are being deceived that believe these lies is at really mind blowing which it is. you know and we know it's getting worse and worse and you know I don't know God's you know said that he's going to send a, a deception too and I know we're in the end days right now for sure you know and this is what as I opened up if you, you know anybody who thinks that they know the word good enough man this you know mm mhm the, 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 that's a dangerous place to find yourself in. You, you've got to be in the position where you know that you need to stay in the Word and allow the Holy Ghost to, to guide you through all the different things that are coming down the pike here. I mean, uh, so, yeah, we, we can never know enough. Uh, and we're, we're going to cover some of that as we go on here. So it says, let's begin our study of First John chapter 1. So if you'll pick it up there in verse 1. Uh, Ed. Okay. First John 1 John 1.1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. This is a clear declaration that this is the first-hand account, an eyewitness of the things taught by Jesus. And the Apostle John certainly has the ability to do this as he was with Jesus from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Matthew 4, 17 through 22. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from then, he saw two, other, two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And said immediately, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. So, what I want us to understand is that John, he was with Jesus basically from the beginning of his ministry, and uh, and the thing that I'd like to point out about uh, John and and of course James and 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 Simon Peter and Andrew is that notice that when Jesus calls them, they immediately leave and follow Jesus. They leave behind their father, their, you know, their, everything. They just, they're persuaded from that. That is, to me, a pretty amazing thing, that, that Jesus had that much of an impact, that he just has to ask them to follow them, and they do it. Now, had I'm sure they've heard Jesus preaching. Otherwise, you know, I, I, we just assume that, really. But I, I, I would think that they probably had. Uh, but the point is, is that, and this is an important point, which we'll, we'll see later on towards the end of the, the study tonight as to why it's an important point. So John, his what he has to say, I think is is, you know, is very valid. Well, let's just keep reading here. If you go on there at the fact that John. Okay. 
The fact that John was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry enables him to say, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. First John chapter 1, verse 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. There are not many that can say that they were with Jesus from the beginning, and we should give attention to those who were, such as John. It shouldn't surprise us that there would be attempts to discredit these writings, because if the skeptics could call into question those who were eyewitnesses of Jesus from the beginning, they could more easily discredit those that followed who were not eyewitnesses. But it is incontrovertible that those who came into the faith after eyewitnesses like John, such as the Apostle Paul, agree completely with those eyewitnesses in their testimony. So this is, I think, an important point. Not everybody that has written in the word, you know, have been used of God to write scriptures, <clears throat> such as Paul, such as Luke, were actually with Jesus during his ministry. We're not aware of that, and I don't think anybody's been able to prove it one, you know, one way or the other. So I think it's pretty safe to say that they they weren't eyewitnesses. Uh, Paul even talks about that that he wasn't like some of the other apostles in that regard. But the point is, is that people try to discredit the eyewitnesses because <laughs> it's going to be much easier to to discredit those that came afterwards. But what they cannot discredit is the fact that their witnesses all line up. The things that they describe, that they teach, <clears throat> they're in harmony. They don't contradict one another. The, the, the one thing I've noted over the years that uh, the atheists, the skeptics, or whatever you want, the agnostics, whatever you want to call them, when, when they discuss the Bible, they always want to try to point out the discrepancies. And I, I've never had a difficulty in trying to rectify what they see as a discrepancy uh, because the important thing is is that there is no discrepancies when it comes to doctrine. There might be discrepancies about when something was described, when it took place or where it took place or you know who was there or something like that. But regarding doctrinal issues, what is being taught, what is being asked of us to adhere to, and to follow, that is not in discrepancy. And, you know, the, of course, you, you point that out to them, and, of course, they still say, well, we don't care. If, it, if, it, if this is a discrepancy here, then what's to say that all the other isn't? Well, because it isn't. That's the point. It isn't. So between the eyewitnesses who walk with Jesus and talk with him and, <clears throat> and those that, who came afterwards, there's no discrepancy. And, uh, you know, there was no Internet in those days. So what I'm saying is that, like, take, for example, Paul. Paul did not walk with Jesus. But when he did get saved, he didn't go and enroll in the nearest Bible school. He didn't go and uh, matriculate in the nearest uh, seminary. No, he says that he went straight out to the desert for three years. And he spent time with the Lord. And here's a man who was well familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, Paul was, because he studied under Gamaliel, the foremost teacher of the Old Covenant in that day. And Paul spent three years in the desert, and he comes out of there preaching and teaching the gospel. Uh, it's a revelation by the Spirit of God. And uh, so... That's, it's important for us to understand these things. Okay, let's keep going here. If you'll pick it up in 1 John 1, 3, Ed, please. Okay. <clears throat> this is the purpose of the writings and the testimonies of these witnesses. Uh, no, if you, I'm sorry. Go ahead and read 1 John 1, 3, if you would. Oh, okay. 
1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the purpose of the writings and the testimonies of these witnesses, that we who have come after them could understand how we can have a relationship, fellowship, with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Our primary goal is studying these writings, and studying these writings is not to understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and contrary to the word of faith, teachers who overemphasize faith, we are not to study just so we can have a revelation of faith to manipulate God into doing our bidding. But we study these writings to be able to come to know the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So it's not about having all faith or to understand all mysteries or to have all knowledge, but it is about having the love of God perfected in our hearts through the knowledge of God and his Son, Jesus Christ. The purpose of all of the writings is that we might have fellowship with God and with all those who love God. All God has given us is to achieve that end. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 4, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So, look, what I would like us to understand and concentrate on is that <clears throat> let's not let the enemy or deceivers take our eyes off of what God's intention is. And God's intention is not for us to become proficient in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. His intention is not to make us the best Bible teachers in the whole wide world. His intention is for us to get to know him. This, this is the main focus, his main desire for us. And all of our studying, all of our seeking, it must be to that end that we want to know him and his son, Jesus Christ. It, it really, but what I have noted over the years is the people that I have noted that started out in the faith well and ended up shipwrecked, ended up, whether a false doctrine or, you know, stumbling or whatever, because they take their eyes off of having a relationship with God. They get caught up with the ministry. And, and it's a very common thing. People like the fact that they're put up on a pedestal, and that becomes, uh, you know, a source of idolatry. It truly does. Uh, in the case of, uh, you know, word of faith preachers, which I mentioned, uh, they focus so much on faith and, the, and the, the need to develop faith in their life. And it's not about having a relationship with the true and living God. Listen, I would, ho I would rather you have little faith, because if you have faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, if you just have that little bit of faith, it's enough. I would rather you have little faith, but have a relationship with the true and living God. He'll give the gift of faith as you need it. But these people have put everything out of whack. They're putting people's attention on things that, that God didn't intend for them to have attention on. Does that mean that he doesn't want us to understand faith? and you know, mirror? Of course he wants us to. But it's got to be in the proper order. 
It, it's about having a relationship with him first, and all these other things will fall into line. So let's not lose sight of that in our walk with the Lord. Okay, if you'll pick up, and, and this is the end result, Ed, if you would. Okay. And this is the end result of our getting to know the Father and the Son. 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. It is the greatest joy to know the Creator and to be able to thank Him when we enjoy His creation. He created all things that we might have a relation, a revelation of Him. Romans 1 Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It has all been created so that we might know him. And let us not forget the Holy Ghost, because although John doesn't mention him in this chapter, John will speak of him in the following chapters. The Holy Ghost is how we come to have the revelation of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man? save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Well, let me go back up here and <clears throat> and say this. The greatest joy <clears throat> is to know the Creator and to be able to thank Him, you know, for the things that He has created for us, beginning with our very own selves. <clears throat> you know, we are marvelously created, uh, the Scripture says, and and it truly is. And, I, I mean, every day we could just give God thanks Think about the things that you ate today, all the different flavors. And, I mean, to, to, to be able to take the time to just thank him. The next time you eat something and it tastes so good, just say, oh, thank you, Lord, for that flavor. It was, you know, it, all of this God has created to get man's attention to the end that we might hunger after him, that we might seek to know the one that made all of these things. And so, you know, what a joy. It truly is a joy of joys to know the Almighty Creator. And uh, I just want to mention this about the Holy Ghost, because as we study here the first chapter, you know, John talks a lot about the Father and the Son, but he doesn't mention the Holy Ghost. And, you know, of course, <laughs> I don't want people to think that John is not a Trinitarian. We just recently had uh, a study on the Trinity. And, uh, you know, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. But the point is, is that <clears throat> John does believe in the Holy Ghost as being part of the Godhead. And uh, the fact is, as we're getting ready to study, is that, you know, without the Holy Ghost, we wouldn't, we couldn't know the Father and the Son. You know, it's God reveals all of this knowledge to us by his Spirit. You know, it's the Holy Ghost that teaches us these things. And uh, so let's go ahead and keep reading here, if you would, uh, Ed, uh, I speak. Yeah, the thing I'd say about John, he might not mention it at the beginning of this epistle here, but in the book of John, he goes into great detail about the Holy Ghost during the, the, when Jesus was teaching them uh, during the Last Supper, that it was important for him to leave, that the Comforter would come. Exactly. So, and there is no doubt in anybody's mind that John loves the Holy Ghost, and that he's the one that inspired him to write all this stuff. Exactly. And we're getting ready to, to cover uh, some of these verses in Second John, 
But it's just in reference to this making this point. And then next week when we're in Second John, we're going to cover more extensively some of these scriptures. But if you'll pick it up here and I speak. Okay, I speak of the Spirit of God because some might infer that by not mentioning the Spirit here that somehow John thought the Holy Ghost was not as important. But here John lets us know how we come to know who the Father and the Son are. First John two twenty through twenty seven. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Father, the, the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. These things I have done unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. So, this is what John is going to say in the next chapter about the Holy Ghost. You know, obviously, um, you know, just because he doesn't mention the Holy Ghost in the first chapter, you should not think that he's not a Trinitarian. No, he is a Trinitarian. He, he firmly believes uh, in the Holy Ghost as being part of the Godhead. And, uh, I mean, he, in fact, basically lets you know that with, without that, you're, you're not going to learn. Without the Holy Ghost, you're not going to learn. And um, it's not that we can't be taught of some man, that you can't learn something from a man. But the important thing is that you understand that whatever you're hearing that, that is touching you by somebody's teaching, whether it's mine or someone else's, is, it's because of the Holy Ghost in us. Okay, it's not the man, it's the Holy Ghost. We have an unction from the Holy One. We have the anointing that we have received that abides in us. And it's that anointing that teaches us. Now, if, brethren, if you don't ever have a teacher teach you anything as far as a man goes, right, you will still learn the things of God. If you have his word and you have his spirit abiding within you, he will teach you. But it's his good pleasure to use us in different ways. Some are appointed apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some evangelists, some pastors. Uh, but ultimately, it is the anointing. But what we must do is recognize what John is talking about here. Be careful who you're listening to. Because there are antichrists that deny the Father and the Son. And listen, it's not... The, the Antichrist forces are not just come out and plainly deny the Father and the Son. No, they deny him in the fact that they don't obey him. Many confess that Jesus is the Christ, but they don't obey him. And they are denying the Father and the Son. Because if you don't obey the Son, you're not obeying the Father. And if you're denying the Son, you're denying the Father. So there's lots of people confessing Jesus but they're denying him in their works. And that that's the, that's the problem. So what John is saying here, I'm writing these things concerning them that seduce you, that are trying to, you know, deceive you. Again, this is the purpose of so much of this epistle, is to help us identify the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. Okay, let's go on here. We know the Father. Okay. We know the Father and the Son because the Holy Ghost reveals them to us. The Spirit is indispensable. 1 John 1, 5. 
This, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. This is the message that these witnesses have learned and passed down to us. It is light or darkness. There is no gray area in between. But there are those who want us to believe that there are gray areas. But the eyewitnesses say God is light and in him is no darkness at all. At all means no gray areas. 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. We are either in the truth or we are following a lie. And that means we cannot have gray areas in our lives or we are in gray area, that, but it, we are not in gray area, but in darkness. We can't say we have the truth and still indulge in things we know are contrary to the truth. We must try to justify the gray areas, but rather we must not try to justify the gray areas, but rather allow ourselves to be purged of those of the gray areas. John 15:2 Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So I think this is an important point. It says that, you know, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And this idea of gray areas, look, I've had to deal with this in my own life, where I was at different times in my walk trying to justify gray areas. Oh, well, it's not that bad. Oh, well, this is the, the word really isn't saying this, right? You know what I'm talking about. But you know what? I thank the Holy Ghost that he didn't let me stay there. He dealt with me and said, no, no, no. You're either in light or you're in darkness. There's none of this business of, well, that's not so bad, or, well, it, 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 well, no, there's none of that. It's light or darkness. And so we can't say that we have the truth and still indulge in things that we know are contrary to the truth. We cannot justify the gray areas. We have to allow the Holy Ghost to purge us of the gray areas. And brethren, these gray areas are something that every believer has to walk through. It, it just is. Obviously, Jesus didn't have to walk through them, but we have to. And it's because we're dealing with the flesh. We're dealing with the world. We're dealing with the devil, all working against us, trying to convince us, ah, oh, well, this, this is not so bad, right? But let's remind ourselves, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, so we have to allow the Lord to purge us. Okay, if you'll pick it up and that we all must go through. Uh, we all must go through the purging process, and it will not end until we go to be with the Lord. And that's a fact. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Let me stress that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship. And if we expect to be washed by the blood and cleansed from all sin, purging process, then we must walk in the light. We can't walk in gray areas because it is light or darkness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, except the holiness and the fear of God. So, brethren, over the years, I've had some discussion with certain people that have <clears throat> said that here in 1 John 7, it says that in order for us to walk in the light uh, and have fellowship, all we have to do is, you know, believe that Jesus is the Son and... Uh, and confess our sins, as we're getting ready to read here in the next verse, and that he will cleanse us from all sin. Uh, but what they're, they're kind of 
they're kind of inverting what's being said here. And in other words, they're saying, well, because Jesus has cleansed us from all sin, because we've said the sinner's prayer, because we've come to Jesus, now he's just, he, we're, we're walking in the light no matter what we do. Well, that's just not true. And this is the big if. You know, I, I've talked about this little two-letter word in the Bible, the word if. It is one of the most, the biggest, most consequential words in the scriptures you're ever going to read. So John says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, no gray areas, no darkness. Remember, he's light. No, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Now, does that mean that, that, that we are not going to sin? We're going to talk about this in just a minute. It means that if we are willing to walk in the light, if our attitude is, Lord, I don't want to walk in darkness, I don't want to walk in the gray areas, then his blood will cleanse us from sin as long as we mean that. So it's about walking in the light if we walk in the light. All right, let's pick it up here. Here is where many Christians. Okay. Here is where many Christians fall into deception. 1 John 1.8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There are too many Christians that think they are no longer dealing with sin in their lives just because they pray the sinner's prayer. It is an ongoing battle that, as Christians, we face daily, denying the desires of the flesh, Ephesians 2, 3, Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. First Peter 4, 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ <clears throat> has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Okay, so if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, it could be that John was dealing with the Gnostics of his day, you know, that because they're, you know, they're like the, the New Agers of today, so to speak. You know, that oh, well, it's not sin that's working in us. It's just, you know, uh, it, it's just... It's, but, of course, it is sin. And the important thing is that we don't deceive ourselves into thinking that we're not having to deal with sin anymore. Because I think that so many Christians think that, well, look, once they say the sinner's prayer, it doesn't matter. Whatever sin I commit is not viewed as sin by the Lord anymore. And that is just the, the most, it's just a, a ridiculous reasoning. But honestly, there are just, so many Christians that believe that, that they think that, well, look, I've prayed the sinner's prayer, so God doesn't look on my sin anymore. You know, I, I just worry for them. I, I truly do. And uh, so here are just some scriptures for us to, to think about. You know, if you're, if you're going to come after Jesus, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. You're going to have to deal with sin in your life. You're going to have to deal with with this daily you got to take up your cross daily first peter 4 1 and 2 arm yourself with the same mind why because sin begins in the mind yes it's in the heart but you have to think about what you're going to do before you do it and uh so combat it gird up the loins of your mind fight the good fight of faith put on the whole armor of god resist the devil he'll flee from you we are not to live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. This is the deal that we made when we came to Jesus, is that we are willing to live for the will of God. The whole point, when I asked Jesus into my life, I realized that I had screwed up my life. I realized that the way that I was living was not 
it was beyond not being satisfactory. I was dying. I, I just had no reason to live. And the deal, I knew what the deal was, that, you know what, I'm going to live for God. And I remember in my prayer the night that I got saved, I said, Lord, if this is the truth, and if Jesus can change my life, I will serve you with all my heart, but I just have to know tonight. That was my prayer. And in other words, I knew that from that point on, it wasn't going to be about my will, what I wanted to do in life. It was going to be about what the will of God was for my life. But I just needed him to show me that night, and he certainly did. And that's been many years ago, and he's been faithful to keep me on the straight and narrow, thank God. Not that I haven't made mistakes, but he's uh, got me back on track. Okay, if you <clears throat> if you uh, pick it up, it, it's not a one-time. <clears throat> it's not a one-time sinner's prayer, but a prayer we must live out daily. 1 John 1, nine. if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you think that this means we only have to acknowledge our sins and not forsake them, then you don't understand what it is to walk in the light as he is in the light. Proverbs 28.13 <coughs> He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. A person can't just confess he's a sinner. He must be willing to put away his sin. Today we have too many religious people who think their religious activity will permit them to continue in their sin, just as we can see the children of Israel did in their day. Well, before we look at what the children of Israel did. <clears throat> the point is, is I've heard many people tell me with John 1, 9, that, look, all we have to do is confess our sins, and he's going to forgive us our sins, and he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we don't have to worry about whether we're, you know, committing sin or not, because he's cleansing us. No, they, they've, they've misconstrued what, what the Lord is speaking here through John, that if you confess your sin, then you are going to know that it's something you're not supposed to continue in. That's why it's sin. And that he's going to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In other words, he's going to purge you so that you don't continue to commit those sins. That's the deal. And Proverbs 28, 13 says it. It says, whoso confesseth and forsaketh their sins will have mercy. But if you're going to cover your sins, you're not going to prosper. You're not going to have mercy. So do you want mercy from God? You have to confess and forsake your sin. I mean, it, it, and this is not just in one place in Scripture. This is throughout Scripture. Did you ever see a point at any time in Jesus' ministry where he said, like, for example, to the woman caught in adultery who was thrown down at his feet, caught in the very act, did he say to her, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, sister. Just go ahead and, you know, keep committing that sin. It's okay. I forgive your sins. Don't just, no. He said, look, I don't condemn you. Your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. And for us to say, for, not for us, but for people to say that God isn't concerned about whether we continue in sin or not, is just an abominable statement. It is crucifying the Son of God afresh. The very things that forced him to have to go to, to the cross of Calvary. Every time, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it's an awful, awful thing. Okay, so a person can't just confess he's a sinner. He, he's got to be pulling away, uh, he's got to be willing to put away his sin. Uh, religious people, think their religious activity permits them to continue in their sin. I mean, for example, when I was a Catholic, you know, I was taught that, look, it's okay if you sin because you just go to confession every Saturday and you get absolution and you say a Hail Mary and our Father, and do a good act of contrition or whatever the priest asked you to do, and then you can take uh, 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 communion and everything is good. Beyond that, I was taught as a Catholic also that, you know what, if you say the rosary, however many times, 
that allows you, uh, you know, to indulge a little bit because you're earning brownie points by doing that, okay? So it's, it, it, it's not just limited to those. There's lots of people that think that, well, you know, as long as I'm going to church, as long as I'm putting money in the offering, you know, as long as I'm saying a prayer whatever before I eat, uh, you know, then, yeah, it, you know, it's okay if I, you know, the gray areas. I'm talking about the gray areas again. And the children of Israel, they were very religious in their day. So let's read about what they were. Isaiah 1, 11 through 15, if you would have. Okay. So, Isaiah 1, 11 through 15. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my court? When you come up to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And, brethren, I want to tell you there are many Christian assemblies that find themselves in this, just like the children of Israel of old. They're doing lots of religious activity, but what they're not doing is forsaking their sin. And we can't, we're not going to prosper. Okay, if you'll pick it up here, the Lord is not interested. The Lord is not interested in vain religion that can deceive the hearts of men into thinking they are holy. The Lord corrected the children of Israel and explained to them what they should do to be holy. Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, say the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It is every person's decision, be religious or be willing and obedient, and put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil. So the Lord told the children of Israel, I don't want any of this religious religiosity. I, I want to re put away the evil of your doings, cease to do evil. I, you know, there's so many times that people have quoted this scripture to me in Isaiah, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be as wool. And they just leave it at that. And they don't read the very next one that says in verse 19, if, if, that big word again, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. It's like, oh, no, no, it's just, you know, the Lord is just, no. you got to be willing and obedient. That's about what we've got to do. No gray areas. Okay, if you pick it up in 1 John 1.10. Okay. 1 John 1.10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. It is really about whether or not we have his word abiding in us. And by that, I don't mean how much we have memorized, but how much his word has transformed us. How much has his word been engrafted into our hearts? People can fool others with their religious activity, but God looks upon the heart. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For God looks upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks upon the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. 
James 1, 21 through 27. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and fluidity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks unto the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion <clears throat> and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Some have said to me that the gospel I teach is too hard and legalistic, that Jesus isn't requiring that much from us, that these are just lofty goals that have been put in front of us, but that God does not really expect us to achieve them. So let's finish with this portion of Scripture. Okay, so... I don't know if you've had people tell you that, but I, I've had lots of people over the years tell me, you know what, you're too legalistic, and you're, you, the things you're teaching are just they're too hard, and nobody can live by that, and uh, Jesus isn't requiring that. These are just goals. These are just, but we don't have, you know, he's not expecting us to, have you heard that? I've heard it many times. Okay, so with that in mind, we're getting ready to finish. I know we've gone over a little bit tonight, but if you'll pick it up here, Luke 14, 26 through 35, yes, it's a lot of scripture, but it's important to read it in context. If you'll read that, Ed, please. Okay, Luke 14, 26 through 35. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold, it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sits is not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes after him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an assemblage and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. So does it sound with this teaching that Jesus is just putting goals out there that he doesn't re he's really not interested in you uh, attaining to them? They're just goals. They're just, you know, they're just, I mean, that is the, that is gray area thinking there. And look. Jesus is wanting sold-out disciples. He's wanting people. I'm not talking about that you're not going to make mistakes, but he wants sold-out disciples who are going to learn from their mistakes and not continue to make them. And we're going to need his help to do that. that there's no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So uh, let, we're just about to finish. Let me just... Have you finished this out right here? This is the last of it, Ed, if you'll finish okay. that. Okay, I have sat down and counted the cost and have decided to do whatever it takes to stay salty. This is the attitude we should all want to maintain in our hearts. Philippians 3, 10 through 14, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, 
if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How do we start out this chapter tonight? I, I stress how that the whole reason that John is writing this is that we might have fellowship with him, and truly his fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying that I may know him. Look, this is the purpose of all that we're doing, that I may know the Lord. I mean, really know and understand him. And in order to do that, brethren, we're going to have to press in. We, we, we need to understand that uh, it, it's you're either all in or you're out. Uh, he Jesus said, well, you're either for me or you're against me. There's, there's no gray areas. I mean, I could go on and on with different little, you know, quotes like that. It, it's, it's all or nothing. And what I can say, brethren, is that it's not that we won't make mistakes. It's that we don't want to continue in them. We want to be like, like him, to walk in the light as he's in the light. And what did Jesus say? He says, look. I do only those things that are pleasing to the Father. I speak only those things that he's given me to speak. And that's what our goal has to be. That, you know what, we want to eliminate all the gray areas, all the areas where we want to do what we want to do, where everything that we do is because we want to please the Father. Remember the, what, what a, the first love is all about, going back to the first works, to, to want to do to please him in everything that we do. All right, so bear in mind that as we go on into the rest of the book, uh, he'll, he'll teach us a lot of other things that are, that are very good. Uh, would anybody like to add anything before we close it out tonight? I did go over a little bit, uh, and, you know, obviously I get a little uh, into it at times. So I don't, I don't really apologize for that, but I'm just saying that's, that's what we went over. I've got one thing. Absolutely. It's about the gray areas as you describe them. The Lord says, I know your works that you are either, you're neither cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out. Yeah. And that, he's either saying, I'd rather you be ice cold or red hot. But don't don't be lukewarm. Yeah, I man, that is a great scripture, Ed. And I think that you know the lukewarm period is, is you know all of us know what it's like to be cold, right? All of us know what it's like to be hot. I, personally, I'd much rather be hot than cold. <laughs> and, uh, but the point is, is that when you're cold, you know you're cold, and when you're hot, you know you're hot. And when you're lukewarm, you're you're in between, and it's like ah, you know, it it is a gray area, and we don't want to be there, man. That that's a great scripture, Ed. I like that one. Anybody else before we close out tonight? And you know, again, I, I t like I say, people have said to me, oh, you know, this is these are hard teachings. They're no harder than anything that Jesus t ever taught or the apostles. And it's only hard if we don't want to abide by it. And unfortunately, there are many people in the world today that don't want to abide by it. We're not, I'm not necessarily talking to people on this call. I'm just talking in general that this is what we're dealing with in Christendom today. But our job is to be a witness. I mean, I want to be, like John, a witness to be able to pass on the things that the Holy Ghost is teaching me to help others have enter into that same fellowship. The fellowship that John has invited us to partake in, that, that's what we're trying to do is invite other people and let them know these are the rules for that. There are rules. 
there are some demands that God is making. All right, anyone else before we close it out tonight? Okay, uh, who has it in their heart to uh, close this in prayer? Anyone, please? Okay, nobody? Okay. No, oh, I will. Okay, Cindy, thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I can't computer. It just looks different. <laughs> He's sitting behind me. Mine has... We don't know what's wrong with my computer. But okay, well at least at least you made it. I'm I'm happy that you're able to, you know, partake, so Yeah. That's great. Okay. Well Father, we uh oh we do love you and love your word and we are just uh so thankful for all you do in our lives. Uh continue, Lord, to work within our lives, within our hearts, that we would always be in obedience and walk in your light. And in these times, Lord, uh, it's like you can see those dark clouds getting darker and, and the storm is upon us, Father. But may you give us your strength and your courage that we continue to endure and to live tr truly sold out totally to you. Because there is nothing in this life that's worth anything without you in it. So, Father, I pray a blessing upon each and every one on this call, anyone that may be listening, for them and their families. We thank you for uh, uh, healings. Those that maybe uh, we didn't hear their prayer request, but you know them, Lord. And we just continue to pray for those with, that need uh, maybe healings in, uh, of heart. And I continue to pray for relationships that need to be healed, Father. So, Father, be with uh, each and every one. May we continue to hunger after you and seek you wholly in your word. Thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Cindy. Let me turn off the uh, recording here.